Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre podcast. In this Integrated Cancer Medicine Research in Focus series, I talk to various ICM members about their research and how it is supported by the vision of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine. MFICM research uses cutting edge analytics to maximise the use of diverse high volume data sets and by capturing cancer heterogeneity in time and space in patients receiving active treatment. Integrated Cancer Medicine aims to transform the way the world treats cancer by affecting patients along their treatment pathway and ultimately accelerate cures. Today I have with me Professor James Brenton, Dr Ramona Wojtek and Dr Maria crispin Ortazar to talk about integrated radiogenomics for virtual biopsy and treatment monitoring in ovarian cancer. Professor Brenton is co-leader of the Integrated Cancer Medicine Programme and Professor of Ovarian Cancer Medicine and Academic Honorary Consultant in Medical Oncology at the University of Cambridge. Dr Wojtek is Senior Research Associate and Honorary Consultant Radiologist in the Department of Radiology at the University of Cambridge. Dr Crispin Ortazar is Lecturer in Integrated Cancer Medicine at the University of Cambridge. So to start with, could I ask James, could you briefly outline the disease for me? Of course. So ovarian cancer is a little bit of a misnomer because, first of all, most ovarian cancers don't arise from the ovary. And when most people are talking about ovarian cancer, they're talking about a very specific diagnosis called high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma. And we know that this disease in almost all women who have the disease arises from the lining of the fallopian tube. So the fallopian tube is this important open-ended structure that sits close to and around the ovary and collects the egg for fertilization. But cancers arising on the lining of that tube can then easily shed into the abdomen and very easily spread around the abdomen. So this presents a number of major problems for us. Most patients have what we will call advanced disease at time of diagnosis. In other words, there's been spread around multiple sites of the abdomen. Secondly, because the cancer's had time to divide and grow and often doesn't cause many symptoms before the diagnosis is made, the cancer can change over time and evolve. And lastly, the wiring diagram of this cancer is very complex and it has a very strong potential to be able to develop new traits and new abilities to escape treatment or the immune system. So those are our major challenges, a very heterogeneous, we would say, meaning very different between patients and different within patients, even if you look at different areas of the same cancer within the same person. And how does the automatic ovarian cancer segmentation method work? Perhaps I could ask Mireya first of all. So I would say that there are two general approaches to segmentation. One is manual segmentation. The other one is automatic segmentation. So manual segmentation is what normally happens in the clinical context. So a radiologist will sit in front of the screen and look for the anatomical cues uh, that allow them to decide where the boundary of the tumor is. It doesn't mean that it's done routinely. It's very time consuming. And if you don't need it, like you might do, for example, for radiotherapy planning, there's no reason for you to actually go through the process of carefully delineating the edge of the tumor on every single slide of the image. We do do it in the research setting, and we're very lucky to have a wonderful team of radiologists who do an amazing job at delineating every single lesion in, in an ovarian cancer patient. But that is really very unique. The, Automated method relies on the idea that if you have enough data for which lesions have been manually segmented by a radiologist, you can train an algorithm to learn to recognize those boundary patterns and therefore to produce a segmentation on its own. So for ovarian cancer, that is very challenging because as uh, James was saying, it, it's a complex disease. It usually presents itself when it's already very advanced and therefore metastatic. And so you need to segment several lesions spread across the abdominal cavity. And so for an algorithm to be able to detect all of those lesions and segment them accurately, the training is, is really quite challenging. So we're working on a method to do just that uh, in collaboration with our partners in mathematics. 
And how does it lead on to the automatic sub-segmentation? Is that a different technique or is it a, a continuation of this technique? So that's a very good question. So again, the idea of sub-segmentation is not one that you encounter very often in the clinical context. So radiologists very easily perceive these internal variations in the structure of a lesion. So they can perceive that there are areas that look darker, areas that look brighter. So we call them hypodense or hyperdense. In many cases, they know what it's due to. They know that it might be due to some like a calcified structure, or they know that it may be due to uh, part of the tumor being liquid. So they can see that there might be a cyst, but it's not something that they will go and delineate. But for us, uh, when we do the computational analysis, it's really useful to be able to say, hang on a minute, that is not soft tissue, that is something else. And so that's the idea of sub-segmentation. Can we draw lines around those areas that we know we can identify? That's versus of sub-segmentation. And so in the team, we've also developed a method to do that process automatically. It was led by Leonardo Rundo, who's a postdoc in the team. And the method is actually different to the one that we use for segmentation because we do have some ideas of where to cut. So we do have some references of what intensity values should correspond to the different types of tissue. So the method is unsupervised. It simply splits the tissue into different regions and it iteratively checks whether the boundaries that it set make sense from a physical point of view, if it makes sense based on what tissue you think you're looking at. And that's a method that we've developed and it works really well for ovarian cancer. And Ramona, perhaps I could ask you, could you tell us what radiomics means and how are the radiomics features extracted? So radiomics refers to the extraction or computation of quantitative features from these medical images. In our case, these are CT scans. When in clinical routine, in clinical practice, when radiologists look at these images, they do a qualitative assessment and they, of course, they measure diameters of lesions, but that's about it when it comes to descriptions of cancer on, on CT scans. And we use these segmentations at the moment, the manual segmentations with the automated segmentation, also the automated ones, to compute quantitative features or descriptors of these lesions. And that means put the, the different appearances of these lesions into numbers so that we can then use them for machine learning techniques to integrate these numbers into prediction models, for example, as we did here. And CT images, like other images, are basically arrays of pixels, or we call them voxels, because a CT scan is three-dimensional. And with these radiomics, we basically capture the, the texture or the pattern of these pixels or, and voxels and of the gray levels they, they represent. We also compute so-called shape features because tumors and the lesions that we see in ovarian cancer, they, they can have different shapes. Sometimes these shapes depend on the location of the tumors. And by computing these features, we can then actually go several steps further and we can use these numbers to develop those predictive models. So James, perhaps I can ask you why this work is so important. So as I've just been explaining, our biggest problem is differences both within a patient's cancer and actually between patients. And what we know from looking at high-grade serous to ovarian cancer samples is both their wiring diagram, their genomics is extremely complex and different between different sites of disease in the same patient, but also that means that the immune response and the other aspects of the normal cells around the tumor are also different. And both those things can be very important in terms of trying to work out whether a treatment is working, whether we should change treatment, or what might be the problem we're trying to treat in a particular area of the patient. And the traditional way to do this was to do a biopsy or use surgery to take out tissue and examine it. But the problem with that is it takes too long and many patients with ovarian cancer need chemotherapy before surgery. So we have only very limited access to some of the tissue. So what we really want to use is imaging as a sort of virtual biopsy so we can predict what is happening at a particular area of a patient's cancer 
very importantly, as we follow treatment, we can understand better, predict better whether that area will respond. And if it doesn't, understand earlier why it's not, so we can do something different. Because if we're going to change the outcomes for this disease, we need to cope with this complexity. That's our biggest challenge. Sure. And so how do you integrate this data with other data streams? And which other data streams do you use? Mireya, perhaps I can come to you on that one. We have several different types of data that we look at. So we have the radiomics data, which includes, as Ramona explained, several types of variables. We have the shape variables, we have the intensity variables, the texture variables, and all of that is included in the model. We also have what we call the semantic radiomics features. And by that, I mean that it is a concept, it is something that the radiologist has seen, which we encode with a metric. So for example, they might have seen ascites. So there's a variable that is called ascites, yes, no. So that's how we can encode that uh, semantic descriptor into our model. We also use clinical information about the patient. So the stage of the tumor, we also know the treatment that they received. We know with what frequency they received the particular drug that they were given prior to surgery. So we can also encode that into several variables that we include in the model. And we also have two other very important biomarkers for ovarian cancer, which is CA125. And we also use several ctDNA metrics that have been shown by the team, in particular by James's team, to be prognostic. And the way that we combine all of these features together is by using machine learning. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we have is that these are really rich data sets. So we have all of these data at multiple points in time. And that also means that we don't have thousands of patients to do this. It's a limited number. So our machine learning models need to be really robust. They need to be constantly reshuffling the data, making sure that the conclusions that you're getting to are correct. Um, and so we rely very much on these kind of reshuffling, reordering methods, and also on building ensembles of models. So instead of saying simply, this is my model, I've trained it, it works. We train several of them in parallel. We retrain them again. We change the seasons, retrain them again. And that's the kind of structure that we build uh, based on classification algorithms to get to our final answer. And we do this on data from our hospital. And then of course, the big question is, does it validate once you go to data from a different institution? Institution, do you get to the same conclusions? And so we do that in our analyses and we're able to show that indeed we get to the same conclusions and crucially that the predictive power that we get when we integrate all of the data, so how good we are at predicting how the tumor volume is going to change during treatment is more accurate when we integrate different data sources compared to when we only use the routine clinical information that would be used to decide a patient's treatment normally in the clinic. Uh, James and Ramona, do, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? So one of the key things we need to do to understand how the radiomics and all these measurements we can now make as a sort of virtual biopsy, to understand whether those are important is to compare them to tests we already use in the clinic. So we already use some blood tests called CA125 to predict response. These measurements often fall as patients respond to treatment. We also need to think about other factors that might change whether a woman with ovarian cancer will respond. So for instance, do they have a faulty BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene? And also other clinical factors, the stage of their disease, in other words, how much disease, how much spread there is. All these factors have to go into the mix so we can then understand what the additional information is from the radiomics. And if I may add um, a point, um, what I think is special about our approach is that we take different types of data. Some of these data are available in almost any patient who is diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So having a CT scan at the time of diagnosis is a standard um, procedure. So we are extracting features from something from the CT scan that almost every patient with a newly diagnosed ovarian cancer presents. And also the CA125 is something that is routinely um, assessed. Um, and then on top of that, we add several additional layers. Um, we add at the circulating tumor DNA, which is something that isn't usually evaluated in ovarian cancer patients. 
Also, as, as Mireya um, already mentioned, we don't usually do the segmentation. We don't usually outline all the disease on the CT scan. So usually we don't have um, the possibility to look into radiomics features. But in this work, we basically uh, layer these more complex data on top of the more routinely acquired data. And at the moment, it is, it is very difficult to predict when a patient is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, whether they are going to receive respond well to chemotherapy at the time point of the diagnosis. So we can follow patients during their treatment and see whether CA125, for example, falls. But it's very difficult to predict that before you start chemotherapy. And that's what we are doing here, what we're trying here, to improve that prediction. And that is important clinically because it's a very important decision whether a patient is recommended to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy or surgery as the first step of her treatment. And with this layering of, of data and integration of, of data of different um, complexity, and we're trying to answer this question. So can I ask, have any of these methods been used in a clinical trial yet, or are there plans to use them in, in a future trial? So they haven't been used in clinical trials yet, but uh, I think they are a huge opportunity for clinical trials. And as James already mentioned, imaging has a huge advantage of allowing us to understand what is happening at different sites of the disease throughout the abdomen. Um, we wouldn't have this opportunity with biopsies. We can't take serial biopsies of multiple sites in, in patients who undergo uh, chemotherapy. And especially with new drugs and treatments, um, it is uh, essential to understand what happens in different sites of the disease, because it is, of course, important that all the different sites of disease respond well to treatment, because if in a particular site there is uh, less response than in other sites, then resistance to treatment basically develops from one particular site, and that highlights why it is so important to cover all the different sites, and uh, imaging is a, is a wonderful uh, tool to, to achieve this. Do you have anything to add, James or Maria? So although these methods aren't yet being used in trials, we and others are applying them to patients who've already been treated in clinical trials, because this will give us the best and the highest quality evidence that these methods are useful. And we know, for instance, across other cancer types, particularly lung and colorectal cancer, using the volume and some of the radiomic information is a better predictor of response. So we have quite a lot of evidence to suggest this may be helpful in ovarian cancer. Of course, unfortunately, ovarian cancer is more complex in terms of the numbers of sites of disease and the way it coats the lining of the tummy. So that makes things a little bit trickier to do the volume measurement and to do the radiomics estimations. How do you think these techniques will change the patient pathway? Perhaps I can ask Mireya that one. So that's a very good question and a very complex one because there are many different techniques that we're developing and they're likely to have, I think, a different impact. So, so far we've talked about the idea of integrating different data streams in order to get a better understanding of what's happening biologically and what is likely to happen in the future um, as the patient receives treatment. So from that point of view, the idea, the vision is that before we even start any kind of therapy, we will have an idea, a prediction, a kind of risk marker that will tell us how likely a patient is to respond to a given treatment or not. So what I imagine, I'll be very happy to discuss this with, with Ramona and, and James and hear their views, is that you could even imagine that there might be a situation where the patient is presented with two alternatives if you want to have the patient involved in the, you know, in, in the discussion of their own journey, where we know that there's a given treatment that is more likely to get to a good response, but perhaps it comes with more toxicities. And we have another one that might have other advantages. So this might be something that can be discussed at the beginning of the patient journey, but this would only be possible if we had these combined models that allow us to you know, predict what is likely to happen. So I could definitely see that happening. Another thing that we haven't talked about a lot yet is the idea of integrating data with a different kind of mindset. So I always like visualize it like a Venn diagram 
where like you have the different blobs that correspond to the different types of data. And uh, the type of integration that we've talked about so far is the one that says, okay, what happens if I take everything into account? So if I draw a huge circle that englobes all of the blobs, but there's another type of data integration which says, what is the overlap between all of those different blocks? What is right at the middle? So can I establish intersections, connections between these different types of data? And we also do that kind of work. And it's related to a concept that James has mentioned already, which is the concept of the virtual biopsy. So this idea is because we're extracting all of these radiomics features from these lesions, and we're able to characterize like, quantitatively the heterogeneity of these lesions, it might be possible to obtain surrogate biomarkers for some of these molecular markers that identify and characterize the biology so well, and that we can only obtain from a biopsy. So in other words, an invasive procedure to get tissue from the patient. So, so we're working on ways to connect these two types of data and to see if we can have this virtual way of defining the biology of a patient by only looking at an image. And this has two huge advantages. One is it's non-invasive and two, it gives us a simultaneous three-dimensional global view of the disease. And so this type of technology that we're developing could also impact the patient journey in the sense that, so first of all, it might be possible to be more strategic about the biopsies that you take uh, because you would already know more from the imaging. Two, that might allow you to reduce the number of samples that you need to take. So that could also impact the experience and actually the information that you would get would be even more valuable than the one we're getting now where we're not able to be so strategic because you really don't have any information about the spatial distribution of the disease. And thirdly, potentially in the long term, we might even not need to take some of these biopsies at all because we simply already know simply by looking at the images. So I could see that as another significant change to the patient journey. With increasing integration of this work into, into clinical trials, we will develop or we will increase our knowledge of which um, radiomic features predict good response to certain drugs. And I think this will be a, a huge, a huge step as at the moment, as I, as I outlined earlier, um, at the time point of diagnosis, it is very, very difficult currently to predict who is going to respond to the different treatments. So I think this research is going to make a huge difference to patients in the diagnostic pathway. And I'll explain that in a couple of ways. So we're interested in trying to improve outcomes for women with ovarian cancer. And of course, one of the problems is it's difficult to diagnose. And actually, the radiology of ovarian cancer is really complex. So you really you need really expert radiologists who can really look at an image or a set of images and make a diagnosis and exclude things that are not so important. But unfortunately, there's very few people in the country like Ramona who can do that. So one of the things I think will happen is that all the tools we're putting together to find the volumes and the subsegmentation will help someone like Ramona be able to report many, many more CT scans as a sort of decision aid. It's never going to replace Ramona's expertise, but it's a fantastic way of trying to help doctors look after more patients by using smart tools. Second thing is I think that by, by turning a lot of this analysis into something that's computable, we can understand more really important questions. So we know around the country, patients with ovarian cancer have different access to surgery and different numbers of patients have surgery. And that's really important because we know surgery is a very important part of getting the best chance of cure. So by actually combining these methods with standard of care imaging, we can understand much better whether patients are missing out on surgery and perhaps address those reasons. And also if we build this into our workflow, I think we'll be able to plan complex surgery and find time for patients to have the right surgery they need in a much more accurate way. Because instead of having a textual radiology report, we'll actually get down to very important quantitative descriptions of how much disease there is, where it is. And I can imagine different ways in which we can process that to help patients and particular surgical specialties to come together for the right type of surgery. So I think this is very encouraging and it's important to note that 
around the country, millions of pounds are being spent every year to try and support the fact that we don't have enough expert radiologists like Ramona and Evis to do this sort of work. This brings me neatly on to my next question, which is, do you think that this new paradigm will be accepted into standard of care? From a radiological point of view, um, I think uh, it may be interesting to highlight that uh, there's this data integration part of our work and there's the uh, segmentation and only with segmentation can we compute the radiomics features that then go into the data integration models. But the segmentation on its own offers the advantage of being uh, more accurate in assessing the treatment response. And I think uh, that's in part what James discussed. By having a tool that automates the segmentation of the disease, we can in more detail and more accurately assess the shrinkage of tumors or the growth of tumors under treatment. And we, are, we will be able to do this a lot faster than we, we can do that at the moment. And I think this is something with a big and constantly increasing workload in, for example, in radiology, I think this is something that would be very, very attractive for clinicians. If, for example, once a scan is acquired, before any radiologist looks at the images, if the data go through this automated segmentation algorithm, and then once the radiologist opens the images on a workstation, you get images as they would usually be presented, plus um, the automated segmentation, and you get you already get some quantitative information. You get the information how much disease there is overall, how that changed compared to the previous scan. Then if we look into the subsegmentation, is this change in disease volume mainly based on solid tissue or are there large cystic spaces that may not be that relevant for assessing the disease burden? And I think this is something that could be of huge benefit for clinical radiologists. So I wanted to add the way that we're developing this work is very much an interdisciplinary approach. So you can work on segmentation, you can work on data integration from a very abstract point of view. And that's of course very valuable, but the way we've developed all our analyses has been guided by what is happening at the clinic right now? What are the main challenges? What are the unmet needs? So what we're doing with our technologies and our methods, it's not just to do some really fun and interesting science, which it is, it's also responding to actual needs in the clinic. So we're very much you know, counting on that um, to then be able to integrate it smoothly into the clinical pathways. The second thing I wanted to say is that we are very aware that sometimes new technologies do need preparation and, and do you know, require like, people accepting them and using them. And that's particularly challenging when you have AI somewhere in the mixture, because people's antennas kind of go up. And we are developing several strategies to take that into account. And I wanted to highlight the work of, of one of the members of our team, Cahol Marquet, who is leading work doing what we call Turing tests with different specialists. So we show them the results of automatic segmentation and of manual segmentation, and we ask, do you prefer one of the two? Would you be happy using this one? What is it that you don't like about that one? Uh, to take people's views into account, which we really think will help later on when we integrate our technologies clinically. And he's also developing surveys uh, more generally to get people's views and, and then facilitate the integration process. So just two quick comments yeah, to show that you know, we are aware about this and we very much know that these technologies have to be applied in the clinic for this whole effort to have been successful at the end of the day. Can I briefly ask each of you, and really briefly, because it would be lovely to delve further in, in another podcast, but just how this fits into your broader research. James, can we start with you? So this work is really essential to what we're trying to do because we are trying to use the wiring diagram of a patient's cancer to predict the treatment that is likely to give them the best outcome. And as I've explained, our big problem there is actually the wiring diagram in different areas of a patient's cancer could be different. And also the way in which the body's responding to the treatment could be different, both in terms of an immune response and also other cells around the tumor. So we can't do this without this multidisciplinary team approach. We think that the wiring diagram is very important, but if we can't measure the effects of the wiring diagram, in other words, how the cancer cell programs the microenvironment around it, 
then I don't think we're going to get very far. And we can't, in patients who receive chemotherapy ahead of surgery, understand without imaging what's really happening. So this to us is absolutely essential. And the multidisciplinary team approach is just a fantastic way of solving this really difficult problem. Maria, can I ask that question to you? I come from the image analysis radiomic side of things, but for the last few years I've been working, like focusing my work on the integration of that type of data with other sources of data. And so for me, this work that we're doing in ovarian cancer is the center of all of that, uh, because it's just a, a wonderful example of a disease where this type of data integration can really make a huge difference. So in terms of my research, I'm interested in both how can we connect different types of data, which I call this kind of intersection type of integration, and the how do we put all the data together in order to make better predictions. So both things we're actually doing in ovarian cancer. So this is very much the, you know, the center of, of my research. And Ramona? I'm interested in ovarian cancer and also breast cancer. And there are certain things that these diseases have in common. And what I find particularly interesting is that as uh, ovarian cancer is often diagnosed when it has already spread to different sites of the body, this work um, allows us to understand what is happening in these different sites and how treatment responds or how treatment affects disease in different locations. I'm working on a similar project in metastatic breast cancer. Um, of course, the diseases are different, but I think the information that you can get from analyzing disease in different sites is a lot more. And then if you just focus on the, on the primary tumor in breast cancer, for example, and I think the work in the ovarian cancer and in the metastatic breast cancer, these two projects have a lot in, in common as uh, the radiomics approach that uses images covering large parts of the body is very similar in both these works. And um, by computing these quantitative features and integrating them into machine learning tools, I think we can develop prediction methods that outperform anything we, we have seen before. The most important aspect is to improve patient's outcome and to personalize treatment, to understand what the disease is and to what it might respond best. So this research is funded both by the CRUK Cambridge Centre and also the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research. And I know that all of you are members of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine so my last question to all three of you really is, where do you see integrated cancer medicine taking us in the next five to 10 years? Ramona, can we start with you? So ideally, the work we are doing now is a preparation for the integration into clinical trials. And once we get that understanding of how to predict treatment response, we will convince colleagues in the clinical setting to apply these techniques. And so I think within five to 10 years, we will be able to present the, these gains of knowledge to our colleagues and the automated segmentation will be integrated into the clinical workflow we will know which types of data we need to predict treatment response. We will know better how to target our, our biopsies. And ideally, within these five to 10 years, um, radiologists, diagnostic and interventional radiologists, oncologists and surgeons will have access to tools like the ones we're developing and will see a benefit in terms of increasing their output um, and also increasing patient safety and improving patient outcomes. Maria, perhaps I could ask you to comment. Yeah, so I very much agree. I think the way I see it is that a lot of the hurdles that we have right now are due to the fact that data integration is still very much the exception rather than the rule. We have small data sets, we have to go hunting for the data, we have to annotate it, we have to segment it, etc. That's because data integration is still something that we do in the research setting. Uh, but what we're seeing is that the impact can be huge. And so I think that in five years time, for sure in 10 years time, what needs to happen and what I think will happen is that data integration will become the rule. It will be just normal. We will be a hospital where all of these data is produced automatically, nicely co-registered using all of the tools that we're developing right now. The beauty of that is that not only will it become much easier to do what we're doing now, but we will be able to do it much better because we will be able to have hundreds of patients' data. So we will be able to train better models 
then we won't have to spend time doing this more time consuming work that we're doing now. So I definitely see the future as very, very exciting. And I think we're going along the right path. And finally, James. Yeah, I just want to say how excited I am about going forward with Maria and Ramona and Evis and the wider team, because I think where we're going now is even deeper into that data integration question. We've talked a lot about the diagnostic pathway and what we might know before a patient starts treatment. But I think the really amazing thing is that we'll bring in new imaging methods. So that includes imaging that can tell us what's happening in terms of the metabolism of a cancer, or even potentially whether a medicine is hitting the target in a cancer. The team have developed new ways of very precisely biopsying, that's taking a piece of tissue from these areas we can see that are different on the imaging. And I see us looking at the single cells from patients who are having treatment and all of us working on bringing that data together to really understand why some areas of the cancer are responding and some areas are doing much better. And by using that in real time in patient care, being able to really change things for patients. And that's just not possible without the team and the way we've come together. And I think that's so exciting. Just remains me to say thank you very much for sharing your research and your views with me today. It's been such an interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want to find out more about the work of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine, please visit our website at www.integratedcancermedicine.org, where you can find details of the ICM vision, all the current research, clinical trials, resources, publications and team information. You can keep up to date with our latest news and events and you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you would like more information about the work of the CRUK Cambridge Centre, please go to www.cruk.cambridgecentre.org.uk or you can connect with us on Twitter using our handle at CRUK Cam Centre. Thanks for listening and do join us again soon.